That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I um, am so excited to have so many of you here watching this. Um, you know, it's a, it's a strange time and it's a strange year and doing this virtually is a little bit more complicated, but it also is super exciting because it means we have people joining us from all across the country, all across the planet, maybe even outer space. Uh, I want to quickly thank Texas A&M for hosting this panel. It is called Pushing Our Bodies and Minds Beyond the Limits. We're going to get into a whole lot of that over the next hour. Texas A&M, one of the top-ranked universities, holds a land, sea, and space grant. I'm Jamie Stockwell. I'm a native Texan. I spent uh, many years in Texas as a journalist. I now work at the New York Times. I'm a deputy editor on the National Desk. When I was nine years old, I dreamed of becoming an astronaut. Instead, I grew up to become a journalist who today gets to interview an astronaut and a sports psychologist about the boundaries of space and gravity and the ways in which we push uh, our minds and bodies beyond the limit. I'm super excited about this conversation and about both of our panelists who are formidable leaders and experts in their fields. Dr. Bonnie Dunbar, who is a professor of aerospace engineering and leads the Aerospace Human Systems Laboratory in that department at Texas A&M. She's a member of the prestigious National Academy of Engineering, a retired NASA astronaut who has made five space shuttle flights. She is the recipient of many awards and has been inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. And Dr. Ryan Pitzinger, the Director of Counseling and Sports Psychology, as well as an Assistant Athletics Director at Texas A&M, where he works closely with student athletes. Let's begin with Dr. Dunbar. You've played such a significant role in space exploration, and it's hard to pick a starting point, but let's go back to 1979 and to Skylab, our nation's first space station. Its re-entry was an international media event and a scene out of a blockbuster Hollywood film. As it hurtled toward Earth, NASA was not alone in worrying that the 77-ton space station could fall apart over populated areas and do real damage to people and property. Thankfully, it all ended well. Dr. Dunbar, you were seated in mission control at NASA serving as a navigation officer. I can only imagine the stress. How did you manage that? Or was it just another day at the office? Well, it's somewhere in between. And, and so uh, it wasn't that it was suddenly hurtling in. We had uh, Skylab up there, three crews that uh, visited it. And any orbiting body will eventually decay. And we had hoped to reboost it since it was the uh, United States' first space station. Uh, but the funding for that didn't come from Congress. So what we did, and we started nine months before that, actually we could still command and control it and it had solar rays. And what we would do is we would manage its orientation and such that there was still some drag so we could monitor the decay and then pinpoint where it would actually uh, enter the Earth's atmosphere and break up. And so we, uh, doing that for nine months, kind of pinpointed it towards the Indian Ocean and most of it did break up over the Indian Ocean. We had a couple of, I think, film vaults and maybe a small fuel tank that, that landed in uh, some areas of Australia. They didn't seem to mind. They exhibited them. There's a museum now <laughs> there. Uh, so, but we, uh, I was on shift, uh, you know, eight hours a day for nine months uh, with my whole team. You know, I was just part of the team as the guidance and navigation officers would plan for that reentry. And that stress is. was not something I was thinking about. We were really focused. <laughs> Just had a job to do and you did it. Right. That's so exciting. Uh, Dr. Pitzinger, history has shown that American astronauts tend to cope well with a constantly dangerous and stressful environment. Mm -hmm. Even so, among recent studies on the topic is a finding that for some, missions into space can cause the brain's gray matter, which is tied to learning and memory, to deteriorate. Is this an issue we need to better understand for future space missions or even eventually living on the moon or Mars? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's actually some, some recent research that's, that's come out that shows that 
some, in some areas of the brain, the gray matter increases, and in other areas of the brain, the matter decreases. And uh, that, that can impact our vision, impact um, concentration, focus, as well as other um, physiological uh, functions. And so I think it's really important that we continue to research and really understand um, exactly what's occurring and then also how we can help combat that or help manage that. And I'm, I should point out that right now we're not, we're not carrying that as one of our big risks. <laughs> you know, there may be some preliminary data. It's definitely not, uh, they're not extracting the gray matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, this might be something to look at in the future, and, and, but we don't see mm -hmm. any uh, cognitive uh, impairments from what we're doing right now. So the real questions are what happens to really long missions, three to four years? I think, don't you agree, Ryan, just as we look forward? Yeah, absolutely. The, the research is actually really encouraging that they haven't found any long-term effects. And, mm -hmm. and with those longer missions, um, there, there seems to be maybe some other psychological uh, concerns such as like how to manage um, loneliness and manage being away from mm -hmm. different types of uh, family and friend support, um, as well as how to just manage relationships. You're in a confined space. And so there's maybe some other things that, that uh, deserve some attention when it comes to those longer missions. Oh, those are very important points. I mean, uh, Dr. Pitzinger, the Scott Kelly, the American astronaut, mm -hmm. and his Russian counterpart spent 340 days together on the um, International Space Station uh, in a space that's no bigger than a football field, really. And so you bring to mind a really interesting, really fascinating thought here. How do minds and bodies adapt to living mm -hmm. in such small spaces for such long periods? It sounds like this is an area that you're maybe studying. Mm -hmm. So I can kind of touch a little bit on it, and then I'd love to, to hear from Dr. Dunbar about um, how, how she actually managed that in, in real life. And so uh, I think some ways that, that we manage relationships in confined spaces is very similar to how we manage uh, relationships in other areas of our life, right? Whether that be a significant other, or spouse, children, um, even colleagues at work. And I think one of the important things is to be able to try to be respectful, try to hear and, and um, validate people's experiences, um, but also be willing to set boundaries. And I think that one of the things about being in a confined space is the isolation. Um, and so being able to really be aware of that and engage in healthy coping behaviors, whether that be some form of self-care, um, mindfulness, in, in order to help manage that. But Dr. Dunbar, I didn't know if you had any um, kind of stories or experiences of, of being in some of those confined spaces. Well, uh, definitely I was on the shuttle and the space, Russian space station there, but in a professional astronaut corps, they actually select in. So unlike being just a general population mm -hmm. where you might pull in volunteers, people that are selected to go to space uh, are evaluated and usually selected after their 30s. So they've already demonstrated how they cope with, with stress and, and in uh, groups of people. In fact, I remember one of the interview questions I had was, had I ever played sports, been on a team? You know, and then they, some of the physical uh, filters were to put us into a small space for an undetermined amount of time to see how we reacted mm -hmm. to that. So you first of all filter in, and then they do include coping skills, particularly for the long missions. We have international crews, uh, you know, mixed genders, all kinds of different people. A crewmate trained together for from anywhere from a year to three years, and so they're observed during that time. Uh, and, and if there's any problems, uh, you know, and we're mature adults, we, we do conflict <laughs> resolution, we go through all of that, and you won't be picked for a flight unless you've demonstrated that you can get along with the folks on your crew. Where I think that we're gonna see some um, interesting results are uh, some of these uh, upcoming suborbital flights like Virgin Galactic, where you put a group of passengers together had very little time with one another, put them in that stressful environment, even if it's four to six minutes of microgravity. And then the, the discussion about putting passengers on a mission to the moon that, you know, maybe they've had very little training. I think that's where you're going to see some of the, the dynamics that we mm -hmm. see and just the normal population. So uh, I know our flight surgeons uh, at NASA are very interested in that as well. 
Yeah, and it's interesting, um, you mentioned Scott Kelly's name earlier, and in his book, he actually mentioned that um, the cohesion and the team dynamics, it, you know, amongst astronauts and, and on the um, different missions are very similar to at high achieving athletic teams, that really that cohesion and that dynamic is incredibly important to being able to perform at a really high level and manage all the different stressors and um, dynamics that, that come up. Well, definitely yeah. this, the other difference is that your life may depend mm -hmm. on your buddy. <laughs> it's a, we call it an extreme environment. So safety is incredibly important in understanding your role on the crew, the crew mm -hmm. structure, and uh, being uh, respected uh, for your knowledge on the crew are extremely important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine you come to rely on each other so much for everything and those bonds must be really tight. Um, Dr. Pitzinger, you, you raise a really interesting issues and I'm wondering if you can just explore a little bit more the parallels to the stresses on the mind and body from exercise to what happens with space travel. Yeah, so what some of the research shows is, is that um, being in um, kind of a, a pressure packed or a stressful situation, right? Um, that that can take its toll. And so being able or needing to perform at such a high level for an elongated period of time can take a toll, whether that be on our ability and willingness to concentrate and focus, um, and also on how well we can carry out a specific task. So for example, one of the, the things that um, seems to come up is our ability to get sleep up in space and, and maintain a really healthy sleep pattern. And we know how much sleep impacts are, are functioning. And if we need to do something or tasks at very, very high levels, um, that can be impeded upon that. And, and also with exercise, yes, there's, there's ways to exercise. Up in space, they've done a really good job of that, of, of not only researching that, but also being able to carry that out in applied ways. Um, but sometimes that looks different than what people are used to. So Dr. Dunbar, I didn't know if, if you, um, kind of how you, how you manage some of the sleep up there. Well, we, we fly with a, a script called a flight plan. It doesn't matter where the sun is. You know, if you're in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, a full year, you still work, you know, to a circadian rhythm, sleep to a circadian rhythm. So in order to manage all the resources and experiments and everything on board for a certain period of time, uh, we have what's called a flight plan. And it always puts in sleep, okay? So we were more tightly uh, scheduled on short space shuttle flights that it was sleep uh, varied uh, maybe on launch day or landing day six hours but typically it was eight hours and it was a 24-hour circadian day we'd have breakfast lunch and dinner planned out and so being uh, restful rested is important to, for safety mm -hmm. and so that if we found uh, one of our crew members getting up in the middle of the night to look out the window, we'd remind them that they needed to be sleeping mm -hmm. so that they were sharp the next day, basically. Uh, so in the space flight, we do manage sleep, manage diet. Uh, in the station, every crew member exercises for at least an hour a day. On the space shuttles, it was usually the commander and the pilot to make sure their cardiovascular system mm -hmm. was robust for landing, because they had to land the spacecraft. But we were very conscious about exercise for health but the crews report on station that exercise is also important for mental well-being. I think we all feel better after we've had a good exercise period. Absolutely. Definitely. I can imagine it'd be really difficult to sleep though. You can look out the window and see the most <laughs> breathtaking uh, scenery and sight of, of yeah. the earth. So it has to be difficult. Fortunately, we had some long work days. I was always pretty <laughs> tired. <laughs> Head hits the pillow and down. Well, this is, uh, you kind of touched on something I wanted to talk to you about, and that is that a central focus of your studies is related to the effects of weightlessness, weightlessness on bone, muscle, the immune and cardiovascular systems. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that research and its outcomes? Well, you know, Prince, uh, although I did my dissertation on bone osteoporosis, tissue osteoporosis, the effect of simulated weightlessness on bone structure, when I was in space, I was mostly the rat, you know, I was the guinea pig, so I was part of the research team. Uh, we identified back in Skylab, I'm glad you brought it up, a number of potential risks. And actually, that was the first time we saw bone loss from the load-bearing bones, the calcium loss. 
And so we've cataloged all of these potential risks through the Human Research Program, NASA HRP, which you can Google, and an institute that we call Translational Research Institute for uh, Space Health, TRISH. And they catalog all the risks. Uh, they identify what they call red risks and priorities. Uh, at the present time, uh, we think that we've pretty well reduced the risk for most people on uh, bone loss or calcium through exercise uh, and diet, for example, mm -hmm. which are critically important for people on, on the earth. Uh, just to get back to disuse osteoporosis, you know, you had three healthy male astronauts on Skylab at, for 84 days that were excreting calcium at the level of a postmenopausal woman, okay? So that's why we call disuse osteoporosis, which if you took it to a final conclusion would lead to brittle bones and, and um, fractures. And so we had to understand why that was happening. And that research has really benefit, benefited a, a large percentage of the population on the earth in understanding how you lose bone, how you can keep your bone. Uh, the cardiovascular system actually doesn't have to work as hard. So exercise is important, but also understanding where and how the losses are, uh, occur are important. We look at the immune system. We see changes in the immune system that would indicate that perhaps you ought to be getting sicker in space, but we don't. There's many things we don't understand. The neurovestibular system is an area of study, mostly in adaptation. And why do people not feel well the first two days of flight? And why do some people who come from zero gravity back to the earth get sick then, who don't get sick going up? So it's not like motion sickness, it's very different. <laughs> uh, people that have been motion sick on the earth don't seem to be motion sick on in space, but we also can't predict it either, either way. You know, it's, it's just the way your vestibular system responds. So the station is a wonderful platform for understanding these, the effects to weightlessness on the human body as we plan to go to Mars. What we don't know and why the moon's also very important is what fractional gravity uh, does to the body. You know, cause it, does it actually prevent some of these things? The sixth gravity on the moon, the three eighths gravity on Mars. That's the big question mark. If, if that's preventive, that would be wonderful. You could spend a year on the surface of Mars and not worry about bone loss, but we don't have the answers to those questions yet. Did you ever get sick in space? Did you ever have like any kind of illness? Not not necessarily motion sickness, but. Well, I, I was very either. lucky I didn't, but I can't say it was due to anything I did. It was just <laughs> genetics, you can't predict it, so. We can't, no, that's that's so interesting. Um, you, I, I touched on this already just a little bit, but I'd love some more detail. You spent more than uh, 1,200 hours in space or the equivalent of 50 days, and a lot of it, you know, as you just talked about, is spent studying how bodies respond to low gravity for long periods. Um, what else happens to our bodies in space? Well, the first thing that happens is that um, because you have a fluid shift, you're not really hanging upside down, but you're weightless, like being in bed for a long period of time. And the body thinks you have too much fluid because it, it migrates to around the neck. And so you excrete about a liter of fluid over the next two days. So after about two days, you're, you're normal. You just have less liquid in your body and you're okay unless you come back down to earth gravity. And if that were to, if you didn't replenish those fluids and you were sitting up and you came down on the shuttle, for example, the gravity could pull the the blood from your head because your heart wasn't as strong. So we called that anorthostatic intolerance. So we always would drink 32 ounces of fluid before landing to make sure we replenish those fluids. That's why if you look at the pictures of, of astronauts when they first go to space, they might have a puffy face and then mm. that face gets normal. What you don't see after day five is they've got really skinny legs. <laughs> And back during Apollo and Skylab, they used to call those chicken legs. Because they get nice, really skinny legs when you went up there five days. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pitzinger, that sounds like, I mean, even more intense than an ultra marathon or a, you know, 10 day mm -hmm. uh, ultra race. But so I think drawing that parallel to what is, you know, what is it about coping with high stress jobs and, and pressure filled mm -hmm. lives? Like what's your advice for everyday management of that type of tension and strain. 
Yeah, um, I think one of the first things is to allow ourselves to do it. I know that sounds kind of silly, but oftentimes when we're in really stressful situations, we don't even allow ourselves the opportunity to gain that awareness or that acknowledgement that, hey, there's something going on here. Uh, and so just being able to take a step back and really acknowledge, um, okay, hey, what am I feeling and, and why am I feeling this way? And some situations don't allow for that, but most do. And another piece is to engage in um, just some, some deep breathing, right? So what we know is that um, our, our breathing is really kind of our, our body's equilibrium. And so that kicks in our, the, our, our parasympathetic nervous system, which is really our body's parachute. So it's actually really hard to be incredibly anxious or um, activated or aroused if we're engaging in purposeful deep breathing. And so um, one of my recommendations is to acknowledge kind of what the stressor is and what you're feeling to gain some perspective by taking a step back, engaging in some deep breathing, and then um, allowing yourself to focus on, hey, what do I need to do to manage this, right? The stressor's already there. I don't really know if I need to focus on that as much right now. I can really focus on, hey, what do I need to do to be successful right here and right now? So refocusing back in that present moment. That's great. That's wise advice for, for all of us, whatever the stressor may be. Uh, and, you know, for the last 11 months, I think we've I can speak for many of us when I say we've lived with an incredible amount of stress. Absolutely. Also, I live in a very small New York City apartment, so it's not quite the space station, but um, <laughs> <laughs> navigating my tiny kitchen can sometimes feel like it. Uh, Dr. Dunbar, I, I want to come back to, to bodies because I just think this is so fascinating. And 65 women have gone to space. You were the ninth woman in the world and the seventh from the United States. Meanwhile, almost 600 men have made the trip. So there's a there's a clear data imbalance there, but does outer space know gender? So in other words, does it treat a male body any, any differently from a woman's? You've touched on a couple of things, um, but if you could explore too, just a little bit more the adaptation to the, to the space environment and whether in it's most, similar or different. Yeah, in most areas, no. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's the, the lack of gravity. Um, you're going to, vestibular systems tend to respond is, erratically in male and female populations. And again, you know, we work with a small N. I've seen some studies where they've tried to extrapolate uh, this small N of females and say, well, this happens to all women. And I'm going, well, it didn't happen to me. <laughs> you know, so that's not a valid study, right? That the hypothesis has <laughs> failed. <That's right. laughs> so I can speak from experience. Uh, but as we gain more information and with all the human variability, there's really, you know, we've got some differences in anatomy and we worry about some of the Im potential impacts for galactic cosmic rays uh, further on, but the jury's still out on a lot of that. Uh, and so we, in fact, I sat on an NIH uh, committee called CAMI for Extreme Environments and uh, for an individual mission for a you know, crew going to Mars, gone three years, the risk is probably no great between, greater between the two you'd have to advise both the men and the women on reproduction, for example, which we already do, mm -hmm. you know, and, and where they are in uh, family bearing years. Uh, there's still questions about long-term effects because women actually do live longer. So they might have an increased incidence of cancer at, you know, 3%, but then we make an informed decision uh, on risk. You know, after we leave the astronaut office, I might go climb Mount Everest, that's a risk, you know? Is that 3% more or do I wanna live with this other 3% and what do the genetics of my family say? Maybe I'm not prone to this to this particular cancer risk. So we're, we're having all those discussions right now. Uh, there's one of the areas of uh, real discussion right now is and has had different acronyms, but is some ch vision changes. Now, if you just look at the small population of uh, women, it, doesn't seem to be as prevalent in the women as the men, but that we don't have the good statistics yet. What we need to worry about is that there may be some subset of the population that has vision changes, uh, you know, a year, a year and a half out there. And so how do you predict it? How do you accommodate it? Do you send a 3D printer so you can print your own eyeglasses, you know, a year and a half into the mission, you're on Mars and your prescription changes? <laughs> You know, that's a great idea. <laughs> so, uh, well, that could change anyway. You know, right? What do you do? And you asked about body changes. The other thing that happens is, of course, you lose the fluid, but you don't have gravity compressing the spine, so you typically grow. 
half an inch, an inch. And that has an impact on spacesuits that are fitted on the ground. So we always add a little bit of space on the length of our pressure suits. These are the EVA suits mm -hmm. to accommodate that growth or that elongation of the spine. And while you might be a little taller in space, uh, coming back to Earth, is, especially after six months or, or years, is a strain on your vestibular system, your balance. But a lot of astronauts complain of now the back aches as the spine starts to compress and okay, compress again. Take, Ouch. Yeah, take its other shape that it takes in EGOG. Well, how long does it take to get taller? And then how long does it take to get back to your oh. normal height? <laughs> You know, I don't know how long it took to get taller. I, I was about a half an inch taller uh, after my last 13 day flight. And uh, within a day, I'd, I'd lost that half inch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would love to be a half inch taller. And then, yeah, then you're kind of bumping your turn. But this raises like really interesting questions too, and dyna sets up a dynamic for space tourism, which could be around the corner, maybe, potentially. Um, so considering everything that goes into becoming an astronaut, all of the training, all of the ways in which the body changes, uh, the things that you've studied, does it concern you? And, w and this is a question for the both of you. Is it safe enough for bodies and minds uh, for somebody like me to go up to space with, with no training who just has the money to, and I don't have the money, let's make that clear. <laughs> I cannot get onto the Dragon 9 model, but... Uh, does it concern you and, and is it safe? Well, I think this is where Ryan can help me. From a physiological point of view, of course, the four to six minutes on the suborbital, uh, which is coming first, Virgin Galactic, uh, you, you may have some vestibular disturbances. About 50% of the people aren't going to feel well, okay? And maybe you can brief them on that. You can give them the, the vomit bag, okay? <laughs> uh, but I think where the, the real challenge is going to be is for many people who will sign an informed consent uh, that there will be this is a new environment and this is going to be new stresses mm -hmm. may not always be fun so how do you train those people to cope who may have never come from an aviation background never flew an airplane uh, never you know went on the ferris wheel really fast or something <laughs> like that. you know, how do you train them to cope with this environment where suddenly they don't know where up and down is and it's a completely uh, different scenery around them and they've got six minutes to do what they need to do and then get back in their seat and buckle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a really, really good point and the amount of preparation that is um, currently, that, that, that astronauts currently go through um, from a psychological standpoint, whether that's taking various assessments, um, being put through you know rigorous different activities and tasks that, that was mentioned earlier, uh, if that's not done, then what sort of risk are, are those people getting into? But also, what sort of risk are they opening the others that are that are around them up to? Um, and I also think that a lot of the comforts that we have here on Earth, right? Like if if somebody experiences a mental health concern, they can go to a psychologist. They can um, go receive the help that they need. That's not as easy when you're up in space. And, and so making sure that people have that um, stability from a mental health standpoint. So it's assessing for suicidality, um, depression, anxiety, uh, different things like that so that we're not putting that person as well as other people at, at risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for the professional uh, astronauts, we actually have a psychological support group in mission control. So even though we may have been trained on these coping skills, in order to keep us uh, stimulated, connected to family and friends, uh, right now uh, a crew member on the station can uh, use a, a, a cell phone to the computer to call anybody on the surface of the earth they want, not just family. So if they have a wish list and they want to talk to a particular entertainer or journalist, uh, NASA will help them get the phone number and set up the phone call. The same for the Russian cosmos. Yes. They have the same thing in, in Moscow as well. But you're right. Uh, or if you buy a ticket now on a commercial airplane, you don't have a ground support group if you get stressed <laughs> out. <laughs> that is so cool. Well, on the total opposite end of that spectrum. So here, you know, with space tourism, we're talking a few minutes uh, up in space. but 
for those, we know humans can live in space for at least 437 days uh, because a Russian cosmonaut did. What, if any, concerns do you have, in both of you, regarding a, a human's ability to live and operate efficiently during extended space flights, or even, you know, if it comes to be living on Mars or the moon? Well, I, I personally don't, uh, you know, training and research, I have no doubt that, you know, for the people that are in the core now and planning to go to the moon and on to Mars, that's why they're there. They're not being forced mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, what we need to ensure is that the biomedical effects, the physiological effects are well understood and countermeasures are in place to, to keep them healthy uh, and that they have coping mechanisms as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the, the greater risk, and Ryan can talk about this, is, is those things we observed in Antarctica. So one of the analogs we use is Antarctica, where a lot of people are thrown together that didn't know each other, didn't train together, and they're stuck together for six months. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, Ryan, have you done any support on yeah, I haven't done any up in Antarctica, <laughs> um, but but um, I think that that's a really in, important point that um, being able to have that conflict resolution, um, the the cohesion, and how do you manage these different personalities and um, different types of of relationships? So there's sometimes we can work really well with with. Um, certain types of people and then other types of people because of personality characteristics we just can't um, or it's, it's a lot more difficult for us. I think another component is the isolation. Not, not only just the physical isolation but more of the um, psychological and kind of emotional isolation and so that's because if it's for an elongated period of time there, there's going to be life events that happen like death of a loved one um, changing things down on earth right and so I think it's really difficult to be alone and not know exactly, right? There's a lot of things that are out of our control. And, and when we feel out of control, sometimes that's at, or at our worst. I, I know that's the case for me. And so um, being able to find ways to, to manage those, those emotions um, and, and find the meaningful connections when you can. Well, I, I, you know, even on the station, uh, the uh, crew is, and I think it's part of research, uh, periodically answer surveys for the psychologists on mm -hmm. kind of their state of mind because there are ebbs and flows. It's mostly related to, you know, doing useful work and making mm -hmm. sure there's communication at home. Mars will be particularly challenging for communications because it's uh, roughly most of the orbit, you're, you're 20 minutes one-way transmission. So I can say hello, 20 minutes later, you'll hear me. You might say hello back and another 20 minutes, I'll get the reply. So having a real-time conversation is, is a real challenge. Yeah. So during that time that you're spending a year, a little more year on the surface, uh, you and your family have to be prepared for that. Now, I, I will tell you, my in my family, I have uh, several naval officers, and uh, they're used to being out at sea for nine months and having limited communication. And the Navy spends a lot of time with the families, uh, helping them to prepare for that, providing the support for them uh, while they're their spouse is, is out at sea. Uh, but still, it's, it's a stressful time. If there's a death in the family, for example, or some other situation that you uh, can't handle. So I, I expect that, you know, it's not just training for professional astronauts, mm -hmm. but uh, there might be an opportunity in the commercial side uh, to, to introduce this, uh, the concept of uh, stress uh, training and bonding <laughs> for the people you're you're uh, flying with as, as part of their preparation for flight. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And and self-care and what self-care might look like on Mars <laughs> will be an interesting concept. How far do you think we are from being able to build a sustainable environment on very harsh uh, planet like Mars? I mean, there's the radiation damage is a huge threat. Uh, well, you know, the plan is to based on launch windows to try to have the first human mission about 2035. And uh, it's really going to be technical. You know, the mm -hmm. transit out there is roughly six months and we've been doing year stations, year long stays on the station. Being on the planet for about um, 
you know, a little over a year. And the plan is to actually put the habitat on the surface 24 months before you send humans or 26 months to make sure it's operating, possibly scrubbing oxygen out of the carbon dioxide atmosphere. So it's really just a matter of having a plan and doing the research and development. Um, we've been planning this for quite frankly since uh, Apollo. So where Werner von Braun's strategic plan had us on Mars by 2000. So I, I, I'd say we're at least 20 to 30 years behind schedule right now. <laughs> <laughs> How exciting though. That is just, I can't wait. I can't wait for that. And I can't wait to, to read the news stories and to by then we'll have technology. Maybe we can, you know, we'll be blasted into our living rooms in some way. <laughs> um, what, uh, let's talk to just to get into something um, about what each of you are doing right now, research related. Can you talk a little bit about what you're working on currently? And, Ryan? and how that relates, yeah. Whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, I'm not doing any, any research currently. Um, a lot of the applied work that, that I'm doing is working with elite athletes, so very high achieving, high functioning athletes. And um, some of the things that, that we work on is how do we achieve a higher level of excellence? So really taking the skills um, and the strategies that they have and just applying them in a little bit different area of, of their lives or of their performance in order to get that, that tiny bit extra. And so some examples of that is focusing on um, how do we cope but also how do we engage in the present moment? So how do we take maybe, for instance, a NFL football player, someone that is perhaps fearful of failing or fearful of making a mistake, how do we acknowledge that and then focus on the skills and the techniques that, that you're really, really good at and apply those in other areas? So that's really the focal point now. And so um, it's not developing new skills per se. It's, it's taking the skills that one already has and just ramping those up so that they're, um, I guess, applied in, in different ways. So that's one of our, our main focus areas. And then another area that we're working a lot on is with um, social justice, right? And um, diversity and inclusion. And so being mindful of how that impacts um, not only our sense of self as high achieving athletes, but also the dynamics in which and how we can work on those areas as, as humans to help performance down down the road. That's great. You can apply that to a, a range of industries and a range of roles. That's, yeah. that's very cool. It's very applicable to just life in general. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> just day to day living. Yes. For sure. How about you, Dr. Dunbar? Well, uh, I had the opportunity to come back into academia after uh, retiring from NASA and then the Museum of Flight in Seattle. And so I started a laboratory through the Chancellor's Research Initiative called the Aerospace Human Systems Lab, because I was very interested in working on advanced, advancing our state of the art in spacesuits and how they fit, how they operate. Uh, as we move into partial gravity environments like the moon and Mars, we also have to reduce the mass of our current spacesuits. We need to fit a larger population size, uh, you know, male and female. So we've got a number of projects going on in that area with graduate students. And then we are, you know, partial gravity means the physics works a little bit differently too. Uh, so if you, Earth, we're used to convective airflow, you know, gravity draw, drives, um, we call heat and mass transfer. Hot air goes up, cold air comes down. There's a rate of doing that for cooling. If you're only in one sixth gravity or three eighths gravity, it affects all of that. So how do you build the hardware for that? You know, how do you build the life support systems for Mars and Moon? So we're doing some fundamental work in what we call computational fluid dynamics for these partial gravity environments because we don't actually have a way of getting partial gravity environments for long periods of time on the Earth. There's no zero gravity rooms. So we're in the process right now of uh, developing an experiment that we hope will go on a, one of the early lunar landers, robotic landers uh, in 2022 with a Houston company, Intuitive Machines. And if that works out, then we'll have a um, A&M logo, we hope on the moon by December, yeah. 2022. So I've got a student that's done, he's about ready to get his PhD in this topic, um, hopefully in May. So working around those areas and then we, uh, also brought up, uh, acquired the NASA, what we call short arm centrifuge is what you put people on it. So you can 
stimulate or simulate kind of 1-6G and 3-HG and look at their cardiovascular response, uh, be able to look at space systems that might operate in that, that they're, they're horizontal. Uh, we brought that up from NASA. Is gonna, we just finished the building. Um, in fact, we're gonna walk down next week. The, the rotor and the arms have all been assembled. So we hope by the end of this year, we'll be doing you know, performing research uh, for NASA. It'll be the only such centrifuge in the United States. So we're very, very excited about it. That's very exciting. Well, we've talked a lot about the risks associated with space exploration. And I think some of our research gets into a, a lot of the rewards too, but can you each talk about the rewards? Cause there are so many. Um, and I do want to make sure we highlight a lot of the joys and not just uh, the things that worry us about our bodies and minds up in space. Well, you know, we're in, we're at the point in space now this century, maybe where we were in exploring the oceans, you know, 300 years ago. Exploration has its own rewards in the acquisition of knowledge. And the farther out that we explore, the more we learn about the earth, right? If we hadn't gone to the moon, we probably wouldn't have the communication satellites we have now or the earth observing satellites, the satellites that tells us when the hurricanes are coming over what temperature the oceans are. That technology, computers all came out of achieving that goal. And it's knowledge, knowledge, not only knowledge of, of what we obtained when we got there, but knowledge about the process, the, the technology, the research as, as we went on. So for, for me, you know, exploration is a metaphor for learning and for inspiration, the physical uh, metaphor, and it's exciting. Uh, my students, wake up in the morning, they're excited about what they're doing. They may not solve the problems of exploration in the future, it might be a medical problem, but they've got the tools and they were inspired uh, through the work that they're doing, they're doing to explore. So much of our modern world is the product of actually having, been gone, having gone to the moon. We just don't always know it. Uh, can't predict what'll happen when we go back to the moon and onto Mars, but it'll be an exciting century, I can guarantee. And I think it, in addition to some of those things is just um, the, the reward of that achievement, knowing that you're doing something that's far bigger and greater than just you. If you think about that, that all of those experiences have impacted every single person on, on this planet. And so um, knowing that, hey, I, I had a hand in that, or I was a part of this research team, or I helped create this um, is, is pretty you know, re rewarding and encouraging to for, for the next person. That's a good point. Uh, the, the government surveys that look at the, the attitudes and health of an organization always rank NASA at the very top because everybody feels they're part of something bigger than themselves mm -hmm. and they can see the results of their efforts. Yeah. So makes it worthwhile. It is, it's so exciting. I think you both have just described a century that I don't want to miss. I don't want anybody to miss. Dr. Dunbar, your third trip uh, space flight was your longest, lasting almost 14 days as you traveled 5.7 million miles round trip with six other astronauts. Your shortest trip was eight days. Can you tell us your top, maybe your top two favorite memories from your experiences? Well, it, you know, I've always said that out of five flights, if you try to pick a favorite one, it's like picking a favorite child. They all were very unique, had great attributes. But if I had to pick two moments that really stay in my mind, one of them comes from my first flight, which had a very high inclination with respect to the equator, 57 degrees, which meant I could see the North and South Poles and I could see the auroras. So I re remember seeing the aurora australis over Antarctica from above. And it's like the, the atmosphere is burning green and it was just really amazing. And then on my third flight, uh, actually it was my fourth flight, was the docking, first docking between the space shuttle and the Russian space station Mir. Now I'm of the age that I remember watching uh, Space Odyssey 2001 when I was a college student. Mm -hmm. And you had this Pan Am space shuttle docking to this rotating space station. And I was looking out the window and even though Mir wasn't uh, rotating, it was a spectacular moment to close on in this other big space station with uh, 
at that time two cosmonauts and an American astronaut to dock and then for us to have in total 10 people in space. At that time, that was a record, seven on the shuttle and three on the Mir. So I remember those two moments in particular. Yeah, I can only imagine how beautiful that was. Well, I think you, you've had such a stellar career. What is your advice to young people who want to be an astronaut? There was a moment when you knew it's what you wanted to do in life. So how did you well, get there? I was very, very lucky. I grew up in a rural area of Washington State when space was just really starting to become, it was on the news every night with Walter Cronkite and Jules Bergman. Uh, but uh, nobody in my family had ever been to college, but um, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut and I was advised very well by my sixth grade teacher and later my physics teacher to take as much math and science as I could. So I, I started with algebra and I took four years of math and chemistry, physics, and biology. And you know, I didn't do that at the detriment of language. I had two years of Latin in this very small rural <laughs> town, uh, but it was enough such that I had the, the scores, the SAT scores and the grades to be accepted into engineering at the University of Washington. So if you look at the requirements to be an astronaut, it's uh, engineering, it's science, uh, it's medical, medical doctors, but it's all kind of, you have to have that technical foundation and it's gonna start young. So uh, two things, and I'll relate this the other to Ryan, the other thing is stay healthy because you not only have to have the academics to get there, the physical is at least a week long and you need to stay healthy. Um, I think this is a perfect spot to, to conclude. You guys have both been really wonderful to talk to and um, I look forward to reading more about your research and more about uh, all of the great work you're doing at Texas A&M and outside of this the university system too. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having us.